Question for you, how many, how many, listen, let's be honest, right? Church is a place, you gotta be honest. They say confession is good for the soul. How many of you are lawbreakers? You're lawbreakers? Wow, this is a smart crew. The rest of you are actually liars, and so... Um, <laughs> Since confession is good for the soul, let me announce that I am a lawbreaker. I, in fact, I have a record now. And um, do we have a sign, Kent? We have, we have a sign, uh, street sign? Yeah. No, we don't? Somewhere in the sermon slide, we might have a street sign. Yeah? No? Okay. No, uh, it's, it's a no left turn sign. Uh, you, could probably, you could probably Google this thing and find it. There's this thing called Google that... No, I, I'm, I'm the one that sent the notes. That's on me, not on him. So, um, yeah, so if you go to Costco, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, with the giant TVs that drive lust in the heart of every man that walks in, that's right at the front there. Anyway, that's not my problem. Well, <laughs> might be, but <laughs> that's not this problem. The, the reason I'm a lawbreaker is if you, if you pull out of Costco, there's this sign. <laughs> not even there yet. Stop it. Did you do it too? You did it too, did Oh, now she's proud. <laughs> Lord, we know the sin and failure. She, okay, all right, sorry. Uh, oh, hey, there it is. Yeah. So there's this sign, not quite that big. But I need to go that way. Because if I don't go left back onto uh, army, see, look at that. <laughs> it's finishing my sentences now. Come on, you want to come up and preach? Here are my notes for, and uh, it's just so much faster. I can get back to the office. I don't have to go. You know, like where 10,000 people are buying gas at Costco because it's four cents cheaper. And, and so I know there's a sign there. I don't care. <laughs> Turn left all the time. <laughs> Until one of Carol Serene's finest <laughs> was sitting across the street at Lowe's, lit me up, and you know, the little lights that show up in the background. And he had, the worst part was he's like, um, license, registration, whatever, uh, Mr. Nichols, I'm just so glad they don't put my occupation on my... <laughs> Why, he said, uh, did you see the sign? Now, here's the problem. Do I want to compound my law break with lying? But I do have some limits. And so I said, well, <laughs> actually, sir, I do have some limits. That shouldn't surprise you. Uh, I said, actually, sir, yes, I, I saw the sign. He said, you live in West Chicago. Do you come to Costco often? I mean, it just gets worse. I said, well, yeah. And then he asked a question that was just so hard. He said, well, why did you turn left? And, you know, I'm a teenager. So I'm like, oh, I don't know. But I just said, well, well, it's closer. He said, yeah, but, like, there's a sign. And then he wrote me a ticket. And so... Here's the problem we have. We've been looking the last few weeks, Romans chapters 5, 6, and now we're in chapter 7 today. Like we're, here's the imagery, right? We were dead to the things of God and righteousness and goodness, and, and we were alive to the call of sin on our lives. Those things where we, we cross boundaries we, we shouldn't cross or we, we don't do the things we should. And, and then something transformational happened. We trusted Jesus Christ. We recognize that out of God's deep love for us, Jesus, while we were still sinners, died for people like us. In fact, he died for the sins of the whole world. And we recognize that. Somebody told us that. A parent modeled it for us. We heard something at church, a preacher, for whatever, radio. And when we believed it, we, the Bible word is we're saved from sin, from condemnation, from death, from hell. And we're forgiven. And we're made right. And the Bible imagery is you went from death to God to alive to God. And you went from alive to sin to dead to sin. And not only that, the imagery then is you, you went from being a slave to sin. Uh, go sin. Yes, sir, and I'll sin. <laughs> to being free from sin. You, you went from being a slave to sin to being a slave or a servant to the goodness of God. Uh, so, why do we turn left when we shouldn't? It's a humorous example of law breaking. 
Why, can't, why is it I can't win some battles with sin? Why it is with all of my identity that's new and changed and fresh and free and alive? The same old things trip me up. Why is it whether it's an attitude, an envy, a lust, it's language, it's gossip, it's actions, it's activity, it's addiction, it's... Well, why is it with all those things that are in fact true of me? Remember last week I said that growing in our faith, growing in holiness, the Bible word is sanctification. Big word means to be holy, sanctify, sanctuary, me, be holy. That, that it's mostly positive, it's not mostly negative. Like sanctifying is not thou shalt not. Sanctifying is living out more and more what's actually true about us. We're alive to God, we're free from sin. So, man, why do I still battle? Why do I still lose? Romans chapter 7, the soaring language of Romans 5 and 6, so encouraging. Alive, free! Romans chapter 7 brings us right back to earth and said, but still battling sin. Let, let me... Let me give you sort of the answer, and then we're going to walk through what is one of the most difficult and challenging, maybe the most challenging chapter in all the book of Romans. Uh, here's what Romans 7 teaches. We, listen, we will never win the war with sin by law keeping. We, we have to acknowledge that while free and alive and loved and secure in our relationship with God, we are still going to face the, the battle, the ongoing battle with sin. The world around us has fallen, so there's the environmental piece to that. There is the real enemy of our soul who works to kill, steal, and destroy. There's that reality. And although made new, there are still patterns of behavior or attitudes or learned things that we've seen in the lives of others that still reside in us and and so we, all, we react to temptation in ways that we're used to reacting. And so some, some response, some people deal with that failure, falling into sin, by deciding it's time to get serious and let's write a list of things I shouldn't do. It's about putting fences up. It's about building walls to protect me from failure. You need to hear what the scripture teaches. This is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. Walls will never change our hearts. Fences, while they serve important, uh, an important function, will never transform us, and we will never win the war with sin by building fences or keeping lists. Here is the challenge, here is the failure of the church I grew up in, which was a fundamentalist church, had all kinds of rules. One of the dumbest was, you know, you need to wear your hair short, men. Like, there was so much, let me clean up the word for public consumption, stuff going on in my heart as an older teenager, and our church was concerned about how long my hair was. Here, typical for me, right? Like, so my dad, this was, well, I was a little younger, but my dad would send me to Lloyd's Barbershop. You know what I'm talking about? Like every little small town has a Lloyd's Barbershop. And I'd go down to Lloyd's, walk down the street, Mishawak Avenue, Division Street, go into Lloyd's. It was $2 for a haircut. That's a good day. So daddy gave me $2 and a quarter because, you know, you had to tip Lloyd. And, and this almost always happened as I got a little older, right? I'd come back home, my dad would say, that's not short enough. And I'd have to go back, walk all the way back down Division Street to Mishawak Avenue, step into Lloyd's. At one point, you're like, Lloyd, do you not know I'm going to have to come back? Why don't you just take care of it the first time, no matter what I say? And the problem was, I just wanted my hair to be long, right? It was a problem. It wasn't a problem with Lloyd. It wasn't a problem with my dad's rules. The problem was me. And this is exactly what Romans 7 is going to say. The fault does not lie with the don't turn left sign. That's very clear. 
The fault lies that there is something deep within my humanness that when I see a don't turn left sign and it somehow inhibits what I want, I'm like, I will in fact turn left. <laughs> so Romans chapter 7, uh, look at verse 4. Because the point he makes picks up there. Now remember, remember Romans chapter 5, right? Wherever, wherever sin increased, Grace increased that much more. I mean, the paraphrase we used back in the fall before the Christmas break was, was clear, right? Uh, when it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. Yes. <laughs> Chapter 6, sin shall not be your master. Yes. You are alive to God and dead to sin. Yes. So you get Chapter 7, verse 4. Likewise, my brothers. So believers, brothers and sister, uh, sisters, family members, you also have died to the law. Wait, what? I know I died to sin. I know I died to the power of Satan over me. I know I died to condemnation. What do you mean I died to the law? This context, certainly written to Jewish people or to Gentiles who had recently converted to Judaism, it's like, wait, you mean when I choose to follow Christ? Christ brings me into his family. I'm set free from the law of the Ten Commandments. Here's the question. Well, then what's my guide to keep from sinning? I mean, good grief. When I had a list, I couldn't keep it. What's life going to be like with no list? It'll be chaos. And how, how is it I died to the demands of the law on me? You've died to the law through the body of Christ, so you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. And we'll come back to that because that's, he begins and he ends right there. In fact, if you were to, if you were to end verse 6 and skip the whole rest of the chapter, begin in verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, where Pastor Austin has the privilege of preaching one of the best chapters. I don't know how that happened. You get chapter 8, and I'm stuck with chapter 7. There'd be no, sorry, and I'm not bitter at all. Uh, that's probably something I have to confess, right? Uh, you, you could read verse, chapter 7, verse 6, pick up 8, 1, and it's just it's, it's seamless. What happens in between is the answer to two questions. If I can't keep the law, if rulemaking or list keeping doesn't help me live a holy life, is the problem with the list like, are lists in themselves wrong? In fact, look at chapter 7, verse, uh, chapter seven, verse 7, right? Uh, what should we say then? Is the law sin? What's, what's, uh, what's Paul's answer to that? Paul's the writer. What's Paul's answer? Yeah, no way! That's that same strong adversative. It's the, the strongest way to say no in the, the original. No way! <laughs> the fault is not with the law. <laughs> Fault's with me. I saw the don't turn left sign. I just wanted to do something else. I wanted to turn left. And look at verse 13. Second question. Well, wait, let's hold it. Look at verse 12. So, the law is holy. Nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. In fact, there may be the clearest explanation of what it means to live a life that honors God. The law is holy. You want to live a holy life, look like the Ten Commandments. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. It's interesting, those words are all the words used to describe us as followers of Jesus Christ. The fault is not with the law. Law is good. What takes, you know, Americans and Congress and Illinois politicians tens of thousands of laws to do, God did in 10. It's pretty good. Never been bettered. The fault's not with the law. The law, in fact, is the perfect expression of the holiness and the goodness of God. It, it perfectly represents our vertical relationship with God. No other gods before him. And our relationship with one another as well, where we honor mother and father. and We just treat one another with respect. It's good. It's holy. It's righteous, as we are called to be good and holy and righteous. Well, what's the problem? The problem is in the mirror. The problem is you. Well, let me make it personal. The problem is me. In fact, that's what verse 13, did that which is good, the law, bring death to me? No way. It's not the law's fault that I got a ticket. In other words, the consequences for 
breaking the law. In this case, the consequence of breaking God's law ultimately is death. Is that the law's fault? No, there's the same answer, by no, we, by no means. Now look at verse 13. Here's, here's the, we begin to get a sense of, well, how am I gonna win this battle? It was sin producing death in me through what is good. It wasn't the police officer's fault. It wasn't the sign's fault. It wasn't Costco's fault. It wasn't my truck's fault. It was my fault. And that level of ownership is where the path towards holiness begins. We understand, oh, it's not, listen, it's not an external problem. It's an internal thing. And what God does through the person of Jesus Christ is solve our internal, our heart problem. Now, look at verse 15. You probably are familiar with this. Let me read it to you. It's not easy reading, so I'm going to take my time. But if there's a better biographical section of what it means to live as a follower of Jesus Christ in a fallen world, I don't know of it anywhere in the Scripture. While he, the writer, the Apostle Paul, uses law or written code 35 times here, here in, in this chapter, he uses I, me, my, it's all very personal, over and over and over again. You can put your name, as I can put my name, in this passage. Listen. Listen. I do not understand my own actions. Am I the only person that can say amen to that? There, there are times, there are times my own choices just simply don't make sense. What I do not do, uh, what, okay, like I said, what for I do not do what I want. I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. See, there's that sense of it's, it's an internal problem within me, and it's sin. I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. That, that's an honest evaluation that while I created an image of God and, and redeemed and made right, I know that in my natural self, there's not the ability to keep the law. Now, verse 18, the, the second phrase here, the second sentence, I had this underlined. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Yeah, <laughs> so true. Uh, verse 19, I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. I love the way the ESV captures the tense or the mood of this verb, and it's, it's, it's not just that I do it, but I, I find myself again and again falling into the same trap. Verse 20, now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. He, he says the same thing again. Our problem is not the sign. Our problem is not the Ten Commandments. Our problem is that we as, in our natural self, as he talked about there, as in my flesh, as a natural human being, I am incapable of earning God's favor on my own. I'm incapable of living out the requirements of the Ten Commandments, let alone the, you know, the 300 more that are in the Old Testament. That... So look at verse 21. I find, I find it to be a law. Like there's this rule in my life that I see. I, I find it a, uh, to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Verse 22. I delight in the law of God in my inner being. You, you and I know people like this. They don't follow Jesus. They're not believers. But man, they're good people. And they're trying to sort it out. In fact, their desire is like, I want to be a good person. They just find that they can't do it on their own. Um, but 
verse 23, I see in my members, speaking of his body parts, his attitude, his mind, his intellect, his will, there's another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. This is that sense of slavery. This is how he describes those who do not know Christ, those who are in their natural state, are slaves to sin. As much as they desire and want to do what is right and so often can do wonderful things. At the end of the day, what they lack is freedom from sin because they've not they're still in the flesh. They've not been changed. Look at verse 24. Man, it just, yes, there are times I feel this way. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I'm trapped this way. I have tried being so good for so long, and I can't do it so that I find myself wretched. Uh, it's an old-fashioned word, miserable. miserable. I know what I should do, and I do the opposite. I know what I shouldn't do, and I do it. It's left me miserable. And the, the, cry, to the, the, the cry to the world, to the universe is, who's going to rescue me from this? Who's going to save me from this? Listen, it's important to remember. For your family members, your coworkers, your schoolmates, your neighbors who don't know Jesus Christ or don't believe in God, there is no answer to this question. You understand that? It's why they act the way they do. It's why they might belittle you or make fun of you or not understand your faith in Jesus. Is the, most, is the most fundamental difference of our world today. We have been set free and we know the answer. We'll get to it here in just a moment. Pastor Austin, you want to know why this church should celebrate when people find and follow Jesus? Because there are millions of people in this county and in this community and in this Chicagoland area who don't have an answer to that question. And, and they can try entertainment, and they can try media, and they can try politics, and they can try education, and they can try drugs, and they can try sex, and they can try alcohol, and they can try anything they want, trying to do good. And at the end of their day, maybe at the end of their life, they will be saying, oh, miserable person that I am, who's going to save me? And I do not want to be the person on Judgment Day who knew the answer and didn't give it. So let's... Together read the answer, verse 35, thanks be to God. Who will deliver me? <laughs> thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. List keeping will never give you a win over sin, never will. How's it going to happen? Jesus Christ? Well, how? Well, I'll ask Pastor Austin next week. He's got it. I mean, I, I'm at Pastor Austin. I'm actually going to skip into chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 real quick here because, you know, people forget. Some of them won't be here next week, so. The best, look at the end of verse 25. The best you can hope for if you're going to do this on your own. I'm going to try and please God. I'm going to be a pretty good person. The best you'll ever attain is a draw. So then, I myself, in my own natural Heart, I want to serve the law of God. Paul writing from his perspective as a Jewish man, this would have been Torah. Yes, I want to, I want to serve. My heart wants to do that with my mind, but my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Now, you want to see a contrast for good news. Verse 8. Uh, chapter 8, rather, verse 1, comes out swinging. If the end of chapter Seven, when it comes to, well, I'm just going to be a law keeper, ends with abject misery and condemnation. Look at what chapter 8 begins with. So then there is therefore now no condemnation who are, for those who are in Christ Jesus. We all know that, but we may not know the next verse. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Remember chapter 7, he said, I find a law, the law of sin, the law of death, and I'm abject slavery to that. 
Yeah, well, wait, that's, you're not going to be a list keeper. You're never going to please God by being a list keeper. Never. Not before you're saved, not after you're saved. Never. Have I said never enough? <laughs> it's not about my hair. It's about my heart. It's not about the left turn sign. It's about my heart. For God, listen, listen. God, verse 3, Romans 8, God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Like, here's the, here's the thing with the problem with the law, right? It's weak. It's only external. All the law does is define right and wrong. The law doesn't give me any power to actually do right or wrong. The law is weak. It's good, but it's powerless. John Stott writes, the law is good, but it's weak. In itself, it's holy, but it's impotent to make us holy. The whole section of Romans 7 depicts the hopeless struggle of people who are still under the law. They're right to look at the law for moral guidance, but wrong to look at it for saving power. The flesh is weak and frustrating. The uh, law's good, but it's weak. The flesh is weak, and it's maddening. It's frustrating. And so here's where we'll land the plane with some practical stuff. Jesus sets us free from the condemnation of the law so we can live by the power of the Spirit. Okay, where I'm going to leave you in today's message is pulled over on the side of the road with the police officer saying, now, you saw the sign. Why, again, did you turn? And in the coming weeks, we have four weeks, actually, Romans 8, because it's just that good. You are going to find a freedom and a joy and a power of a sin you probably have never experienced. I will say this. Somebody asked me this the other two weeks ago when I, we began this series, Romans chapter 6. They said, that was really good. I said, I appreciate that. Apart from becoming a Christian, the most transformative season of my life ever was teaching through Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. No text of Scripture has transformed me more. Not for an unbeliever to a believer, but from a believer who actually lives out, for the most part, what is actually true. And that's, I'm not over-promising, I'm under-promising, and Romans chapter 8 will over-deliver. Jesus Christ sets us free from the condemnation of the law so we can live by the power of the Spirit. Do you know what the list of rules at our church did for me when I grew up? You know what it did for me? Drove me away from church. By the way, the problem wasn't with my church, the problem was with me wasn't a believer at the time. That always is a challenge. The problem with the church was identifying or making it seem as though if I just check the box of the to-dos, then somehow I'm right with God. So, uh, foreshadowing, how can I win the war with sin? How can I do that without keeping a list? Uh, I'll give you three quick thoughts on that. Number one, remember that you have a new partner. Chapter, Romans chapter 7, verse 4, likewise, you died to the law through the body of Christ so you may belong to another. The analogy, the illustration of the beginning of Romans chapter 7 is, well, when someone dies, when a spouse dies, the other spouse is free to marry, remarry. And when you, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, died to the condemnation of the law, it was so that you might belong in a living relationship with someone else. In this, per, in this case, the person of Jesus Christ. Right? It's, not, it's not that we conform, it's that we've been transformed. It's relationship. It's, I'll tell you about shoes. I don't like to be barefoot. I just don't. And I met, fell in love with, and eventually married my wife. And I grew up in a home that was chaotic and loud, and we never took our shoes off in the house. It's our house. My mom was blind, so she couldn't see the mud we were dragging in, so... I get married, honeymoon, we go back home to our first little studio apartment. My wife says, take your shoes off, Scott. It's my house, why would I take my shoes off? You know that don't turn left on that kind of, no, no man in the room can identify at all with what I'm saying. You guys chicken, you're not even laughing out loud right now. And uh, right now, they're like, no, Scott, we're giving you all the rope you need right now. And so you're right. 
And, and it was, it was, uh, it was a, it was, what's the word, a topic of conversation in our relationship early on that if we're paying rent for an apartment that we can stay in and do whatever we want in it, why would we take the shoes off, my shoes off? You know the first thing I do right now when I walk in the door? We've been married 30-something years. I have been taking my shoes off for 30-something years of that. And it used to be like, I have to do this. Now it's like, I love, I, I have slippers sitting right by the front door as well. I, I have a new partner. It makes way more sense to take off your shoes in a house that you've paid a lot of money for to keep it clean. See, see you, keep, you keep the rules, you're holy, not because there's a list out there somewhere, but because there's a love in here somewhere. You get a new partner. Second, how can I win the war with sin without keeping a list? <laughs> Remember that you have new purpose. And I, I just, I love verse four. So that you may belong to another to whom who has been raised from the dead. Why? In order that, as a purpose clause, that you may bear fruit for God. That's so good. Like Jesus didn't die on the cross and rise again and redeem you and wash away your sins so you could just go on doing the same old thing. No, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to make a difference in this world, and it's going to be for God. That's so good. I just had this conversation with somebody last night. Like, the driving question of our culture today is existential. Why am I here? Not having an answer to that drives so much discouragement, anxiety, and despair. You're here to bear fruit for God. This world will be different because you are different. If that doesn't motivate you to live a lifestyle that honors Jesus Christ, what will? Third, you have a new partner, you have a new purpose, you have new power. Chapter 7, verse 6, the last phrase, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Literally, literally, that would be rendered, you serve in the newness of the Spirit, not the oldness of the letter. There are a lot of people who go to church a lot of times, and it's all on the outside. It's an oldness of remember the mass, or remember the lectionary, or remember the baptism, or remember the Sunday school, or remember the order of service. But they're turning left in no left turn lanes. And they can't figure out why I don't get nothing out of church. Because if you're looking to conform, that's going to be failure. If you're looking for a relationship, that's going to bring you success. You, you are serving in the new way of the Spirit. So we're not going to turn there, but Jeremiah 31, uh, Ezekiel 36, God made this amazing, astounding promise. I will take out your heart of stone, insensitive to the things of God, and I will give you a living, beating heart of flesh. You ready for this? No longer will anyone teach you about God. I will, listen, I will write my law on your heart. Do you know what that's called? The new covenant. Well, in the old days, it was called the New Testament. Oh, you mean that's what the whole book's about? Yeah, that's what the whole book's about. The Old Covenant, the Old Testament's about what God is doing to prepare us for not a list of commands on the outside written on stone tablets, but a list of commands written on our heart. And the, the, the thing that makes the difference is a relationship with Jesus Christ that brings them the Spirit of God so that you don't ever need a list. It's out of relationship purpose and the power that's already there, we win the war with sin. All right, let me pray for us, and uh, I'm going to sing a very brief closing chorus, right? So let me pray. Father, I pray that, Lord, just what was so fresh to me well, a lot of years ago now, from Romans chapter 7 and 8, would be fresh to our people today. Lord, there is a battle with sin and will be until the day we enter heaven. 
But Lord, it is maddening to fight that battle on the outside only or to somehow evaluate how well we're doing by list keeping. Lord, I pray that we would evermore live out the reality of your life within us, the Spirit of God transforming and making new. Father, for those here today weighed down by guilt and sin, feeling enslaved again to that from which they have been set free, I pray that rather than running from God, hiding from God, justifying themselves or excusing it, we would go to a loving Father who stands ready to forgive and help us to live out that which we have, the resource of the power of the Spirit of God. Father, I pray as a congregation, we would live with the knowledge that it is our responsibility, our privilege to share this great news with the world around us, to do it with gentleness and hope and truth and grace. So Father, forgive us for the sin of sinning by trying to keep the law. And help us, Lord, to live in the profound freedom and transformation that comes from a living relationship with you. But bring us again and again and again to the very start of this thing. We believe Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. We believe we've been transformed, and we live that way today, tomorrow, and the next. Lord, make it so, I pray. We ask this in Jesus' strong name, and all God's people agreed by saying, Hey, let's stand together. We're going to sing a very simple chorus, one of the most profound truths that you will ever say, sing, or live. Let's live it out this week as well. Pastor Ryan, come and lead us in that.